My subject for this session is rebellion. And I can tell by the look on your face, you probably think, I don't have any rebellion. Me? Rebellion? I mean, after all, I'm a born-again believer. I'm not in rebellion. Once I got born again, I should be okay. Well, stick with me. We'll find out if there's any rebellion there or not. See, rebellion is an evil spirit that sometimes gets overlooked, especially in our walkout. When we're dealing with these invisible beings from Satan's kingdom and our walkout, you know, we, we talk a lot about bitterness, fear, and all those other strongholds, but rebellion gets overlooked. But you know, the Bible's got a lot to say about rebellion. And that's what we're going to do is we're going to go through and look at what the Bible says about rebellion. <clears throat> also, Rebellion plays a big part in our being in bondage to this invisible kingdom of Satan. After all, who was the first one to rebel? Satan himself, right? Didn't he rebel against God? So, as I said, it's easy to overlook re rebellion and walk out because we think that once we're born again, we don't have to consider, consider rebellion anymore. We think it's, a, it's taken care of. That's not the case because the spirit of rebellion is still at work. It's like all the others. Just because you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that spirit of rebellion doesn't just take off and say, see you later. It hangs around because it still wants you to rebel against certain things. So we're going to look at those. So first of all, we need to begin by defining what rebellion is, or what is the definition of rebellion. And I always go, as you well know, to one of you that have heard my teachings, I always go to my old trusty Webster's 1828 addiction, edition of the dictionary. I use that one because that, this dictionary, and I, by the way, I don't get any fee for uh, promoting this dictionary. The reason I use it is because it is, gives you definition based on Scripture based on Scripture. See, we need to understand about dictionaries and language. Languages change over time and cultures. Every year, the new Webster's comes up with new words that they add, and they delete some of the old words. Well, the 1828 is based on the Bible, and it's the same original. It does not change. So, anyway, that's my little uh, PR plug for the Webster's 1828 dictionary. So, anyway, what does it define it as? Rebellion. How does it define rebellion? First of all, it says it's an open and avowed renunciation of, a, of an authority of the government to which one owes allegiance. I'll repeat this again for you. I know some of you are probably taking some notes. Good. So I'll repeat it for you. It's an open and avowed renunciation of the authority of the government to which one owes allegiance. Now let's go back and break this down because it's very interesting when we look at this, how this parallels with the Bible. The word avowed. What does that mean? That means an act of renouncing or a disowning or a rejection. Now, when we got born again, what did we, uh, uh, what did we renounce or what did we reject? Sin, didn't we? Okay. The word renunciation means to openly declare or to frankly acknowledge. So as part of our confessing and receiving salvation, what did they tell us to do when we came to the altar that day and they got finished with us? And what did they say? Go and tell somebody what you have just done. Isn't that what we say? See how this, see how this Webster's definition applies to biblical principles. So, in case of walkout, we can be in rebellion and not be aware of it. As a matter of fact, most people are shocked whenever rebellion comes up. They think, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. Because rebellion can be very subtle. Rebellion can be very subtle. See, we don't come out openly and say that we're renouncing God. But see, when we look at the way we live in our life, it's evident that we're in, that we're in rebellion. Think about that. When we look at our life, are we living our life in obedience to the one that we have owe an allegiance to? Do we owe an allegiance to God? Right? He saved us, didn't He? So that means that 
He's our, and Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So we owe no allegiance to them. So when we don't participate, when we don't come under their authority, or we ren renounce what their word says, that's a form of rebellion. Now I know that'll probably shake you up a little bit. That'll, that'll rock you in your boots there when you think about that. Now you see what I said up front here, that we're going to, as I should have told you, we're going to kick over some sacred cows in this one. You know what a sacred cow is, don't you? It's any long-held belief that you have, that you've been holding on to, that you didn't know about, and all of a sudden somebody comes along and it's, you, it gets exposed. And you know what? You've got a choice. You can keep it and feed it, or you can kill it and barbecue it, whichever you prefer. So we'll have a little barbecue after I do this teaching here. If you want to barbecue those spirits of rebellion, we'll help you do that. So we'll sprinkle some sauce on it for you, okay? So, we may ask, how can that be that we are in open rebellion to God? See, as a believer, we owe our allegiance to who? To whom? We owe it to God. Because He's the one that saved us, isn't He? He's the, he's the one that sent Jesus Christ to redeem us. <clears throat> now, I just gave you the first part. Now I want to give you the second part. Second part of the definition from the Webster's 1828 dictionary is open resistance to lawful authority. Open resistance to lawful authority. So what does that mean? What does it mean, open resistance to lawful authority? See, God is our lawful authority. See, we belong to God. God is our spiritual father. We belong to him. He created us. So we belong to Him. So, <clears throat> we belong to Him. So, God is our lawful authority because we got, we're born again and we become a child of His and we come under His rulership or we to obey His laws, right? Now, when we talk about authority, we know that we have civil authority. We have, you know, the local government, we have the you know, county-wide, we have the city-wide, we have state-wide, and we have federal government. Those are all in the natural. What I'm talking about here is, is I'm talking about spiritual government. We're talking about the spiritual realm. We're not talking about the natural realm. So, God's kingdom has laws. I'm sure you know that. And what happens so many times is, is we get born again, and then we forget about the laws of God. Or we're not taught about the laws of God. And that's one of the things that we need to be taught about because this Bible here has the law of God. This is the laws of God here. This is the rule book. This is what we want to follow. That's the reason why there's a scripture in the Bible that says, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. If I don't know what the rule book says, how am I going to follow that? That's why I encourage people to study the Word. And God's kingdom, as I said, God's kingdom has laws. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. And that's just one example of many examples in the Bible. Deuteronomy 28. What does it say? And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments. What is the commandments? The commandments are his laws, his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And he gives us all these blessings. What is that? That's his laws. Now then he also tells us in verse 15, he talks about the curses if we don't obey His laws. So, it's, it's no different with God than it is with civil authority. We, I live in a, in a city. And in my city, if I go down and I rob the bank and that's a few blocks down from where I live, I get arrested, I'm going to come, I have broken a law of my city, haven't I? And there's consequences for that. The same thing is in, the, in God's kingdom. When we break God's laws, there's consequences. What are the consequences? The curses. So you see, God's kingdom has laws, and the reason that God's kingdom has laws is that's how He governs His kingdom. How, how would it be if 
God didn't give us instruction and didn't give us laws of how to live in His kingdom. That wouldn't be fair to us and say, look, you're here on the planet and this is it. No. He says, this is what I want you to do. These are my laws. This is what governs the kingdom. So since we're in God's kingdom and God's kingdom has laws that governs His kingdom, we owe our allegiance to God and the Godhead. We're born again. Now, if we're not born again, we owe our allegiance to the civil authorities and in the spiritual authority, the spiritual government of Satan. That's why right. Satan has a spiritual government also. So we're either in allegiance to his kingdom or to God's kingdom. <clears throat> if we're participating with sin, we're obeying Satan's kingdom and not God's kingdom. Therefore, if we're in rebellion to God, we, therefore, we may be in a vein to God and not even know it. My, what does the Bible say? My people. Who is that? Covenant people perish for what? You all know it. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. If you don't know there's a law, you can break that law and not know it. But do you know that if you break that law, let's say, for example, if you are speeding, and you, you, you know, these traffic, uh, these speed limit signs really get me. You'll be driving along and they'll say 65. And all of a sudden, a few blocks down the road, they'll say 55. And if you're not really paying attention, you'll just be driving 65. If a cop stops you, he's going to say, Sir, you were doing 65 in a 55 mile zone. I didn't know it, but still, I broke the law. See, we can be disobeying God's laws and not knowing it. And folks, let me, tell you, let, me let you in on a little secret. That's one of the reasons why a lot of Christians are suffering in sickness and disease because they're breaking God's laws and they're not even aware of them because they haven't been taught about them. That's why it's so important for us as believers to learn the laws. This is what we need to be taught. We need to be taught how to live out the Christian life. Here we get born again and we say, okay, be ye transformed by renewing your mind. What does that mean to somebody that's not... That's, that's never had any teaching in this. That's why the church needs to teach us the laws and the principles of God so that we can be obedient, which in turn brings us the blessings. Because he says in Deuteronomy 28, if you obey, the blessings come. And really, when we're in disobedience, that's a form of rebellion. That's, the form, that's rebellion. Now, <clears throat> when I openly disobey God and the Word, I'm in rebellion and I'm rebelling against God. However, God can work with my rebellion if my heart is towards getting free from sin. In other words, I may be walking out of rebellion in an area, but as long as my heart is to be free from it, and I want to deal with it, and I'm working on getting free, God can work with that. It's when I say, to heck with God, I want this sin, and I'm going to have it, and I don't care what God says, that's when there's a problem, okay? So I'm not preaching legalism, so I'm going to give you a little wiggle room there. So I'm not saying, you know, it's, it's, God looks on the heart. This is the most important thing that we, I say one, one of the most important things that we as a believer need to understand. God looks upon the heart. Remember, only God and the man knows what's in the heart. So if your heart is towards God, if your heart is to do the right thing, and you fall into sin, God can help you and can work with that. He's not going to kick you to the curb. But if you willfully say, Heck with it, I don't care what God's law said, I don't want to participate with it. Well then, you're probably going to suffer a few curses from the devil, because that's what the devil likes to hear. He said, oh good, hallelujah, you open the door for me, now let me come in and zap you and give you my blessings. And they may start out, and they may be pretty good starting out, but I guarantee you, if you stick with them, they'll turn out to be not good. So, I do not want to be free from sin, and I'm not walking out from my sin, then I'm walking, I am in Rebellion. So now, let's so see what the Bible says about rebellion. Actually, there's five different words in the Bible that uses rebellion. Now, we're not going to take all five of them today, so you can rest, rest easy. We're not going to be here four hours talking about five different words, definitions of rebellion. So relax. Okay. So what does the Bible say about rebellion? There's five different words in the Bible. Now, remember in the Old Testament, the, it's written in the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language has over 1,200 words in it. And in the Old Testament, there will be a different root word for each shade of meaning. So whenever you do read the Old Testament, you've got to make sure and look up what the root word says because you can get led astray because you'll get the wrong definition. 
First time it's used in the Bible is in Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. This is the first time rebellion is used. 24, verse 24, Deuteronomy 31. Now we know that one of the major problems with the children of Israel following God was what? Rebellion, right? That was one of the biggest things, one of the biggest issues. They were always rebelling against His laws. If He said something was black, they said, no, no, it's white. If He said, don't do this, that's exactly what they want to go out and do. So, rebellion was an issue. So let's see what he says here in verse 24. And it shall come to pass. Do you know that? When you see the term, it shall come to pass, that is prophetic. Because that's talking about the future, isn't it? And it shall come to pass. The prophetic has to do with the future. So, and it shall come to pass, when Moses has made an end, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in the book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be therefore a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion, and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death. So let me set the stage here for what's going on. We know the law was given to Moses, right? He went up on, spent 40 days with God, and he gave him the law, and he came down, and the children had already broken the laws, and he got upset and threw the stones down and broke them and had to go back up for another 40, another 40 days, right? So Moses, when he came down with the tablets, he wrote them down and put them in a book, okay? And he said, Now, take this, and the Levites, they were the ones that were responsible for worship and everything. The Levitical tri tribe were. Take this, and because they bear the Ark of the Covenant. They, took, they watched over the Ark, and they were the only ones that could transport it, and this sort of thing. And, and said, take this book of the law, and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. If, it, if you um, look at that, it, uh, I'll give you what it originally says in the original, which makes it clear. And the, Moses wrote the law and told the Levites to put it in the ark in the most holy place. In the most holy place. In other words, in the, in the ark of the covenant. He wanted them to put that in there. And so, here, that word rebellion there, here, is Strong's 4805. And let me give you what it means. Rebellion here is 4, 4805 in Deuteronomy here, where I'm reading. And it means rebellion. Okay? Now let me go ahead and tell the rest of this story here to get this right, to get this set for you. It says, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be therefore a witness against thee. In other words, this is the rules. This is the rules you are to follow, and this will tell you if you are in rebellion or not. If you are following this book, it, we know you are not in rebellion. And he says, For I know thy rebellion. Moses at this point had already experienced the rebellion of, of the children of Israel, right? So he already knew their rebellion. And somewhere else he calls them a, stick neck, a stiff neck group. So stiff neck and rebellion has, is very close to the same. So he said, I know you, you've already been rebellious, and you'll be rebellious as long as I live, and I also know that you'll be rebellious after I'm gone. That's basically what he said to them. And how much more after my death? Now, whenever he said, when he, when verse 27 says, and um, for I know thy rebellion, that's rebellion, 4805, and thy stiff neck, behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious. Now, rebellious is a different root word, and it's 4884, and it means to be contentious or to be disobedient towards, or to be rebellious against Father, or God, or authority. So you see what he's saying here is, is you've been rebellious against God, you've been rebellious probably against your fathers. We know that some of the children of, the, of, the children of Israel were rebellious and they had to deal with it. 
So that's what that means there. And a person that is contentious has a spirit of rebellion. If you know somebody is contentious, contentious. So whenever we disobey God, we are in rebellion. We're in rebellion. See, when I started, when I was introduced to these principles of this invisible kingdom, and I recognized that I had all these issues, and I set my desire, my will to change, I had to realize that in my fear, that if I continued in my fear, I was in rebellion to God because what did he say in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 1 7? God has not given me the spirit of fear, but the power of love and our sound mind. So you can see, I was in disobedience to God because the fear didn't come from God. Fear is not part of God's law. Faith is a part of God's law that He wants us to obey. So I had to make a decision. Am I going to be in rebellion and say, oh well, that's just part of me, and God, you understand me. You know, that's just who I am, and really, you, there's people around me, they just have to accept me for who I am. That is a form of rebellion. I had to make a decision to walk out of my fear. I had to say, I'm not going to deal with my fear. A spirit of, if I'd have said, I'm not going to deal with it, guess what? The spirit of rebellion would come in and join me. So when we disobey God and make a decision that we're not going to obey Him in one of his, on one of His laws, the spirit of rebellion comes along to help us to stay in bondage to that part of the invisible kingdom. For example, in my case, I gave you would have been fear. If you're in bitterness and you don't want to deal with bitterness and unforgiveness, that rebellion will come and help you to stay in that, help you to rebel in that. Also, sometimes people come and they hear our teachings and they have a hard time getting started in with their walkout, starting doing the, the walkout principles that we share in our conference. And one of the, one of the spirits that can hinder your getting started in your walkout is your rebel is the spirit of rebellion. Also, when there are addictions, when people want to justify their addiction instead of dealing with it, there may be a spirit of rebellion at work that's helping them and giving them thoughts to justify them holding on to their addiction. Now, if I'm in walkout, I'm walking out of my issues and I'm not completely free, does not mean that I have a spirit of rebellion. I just want to make that clear. I already talked about where your heart is and this sort of thing. See, if my heart is to be free, God can work with me. But if I willfully do not want to be free, then there's a spirit of rebellion at work. Let's say something comes up and I have a choice to rebel against something that God says. And I take in that thought and I fall into that sin of fear, for example. If I go and cast that spirit of fear out, the rebellion won't come in. But if I hold on to that fear and keep start to begin to practice that fear, spirit of rebellion will come along to reinforce it. See, the enemy is just waiting to get a foothold, and then once he gets a foothold, then he wants to see what else he can bring on us to control us and to end up killing, stealing, and destroying us. That's what he wants to do. Okay, the next time that rebellion is used is let's go to Joshua. Joshua. See what Joshua had to say. 22. Verse 22. Joshua 22, 22 says, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion, or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. Okay? Then he goes on to talk about that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord and offering sacrifices and this sort of thing. But what I want to point out to us here is verse 22. Notice what it says. The Lord, the first Lord is capitalized. In your Bible, if that first Lord is not capitalized, it should be capitalized, okay? The Lord, and uh, capital L, capital O, capital R-D, that's uh, Elohim, second member of the Godhead. The Lord God of gods. Notice the second G is a little g. Is that a little g in your, in your Bible? If it's not a little g, it should be. Make it a little g because what is he saying? God, the Lord God, is the God of all gods. In other words, there is no little God. Little g means all other gods other than deity. And the Lord God of gods, the Lord of God of gods, the Lord God of 
little God, little gods, little z-gods, he knoweth, and Israel, he shall know if it be in rebellion. Now, what does that rebellion there mean? That rebellion there is a different root word. It's 4777, and it means rebellion or revolt against. So what he is saying is the Lord God knows that when if Israel is, is in rebellion against him. If you read the rest of the scripture that goes with this, for the sake of time we won't get into that, you will see that that's what he's just talking about, is Israel turning away from God. They're revolting against God. So that's a form of rebellion, is revolt, revolting, revolting against God. And, that, and we can say that that word there is Lord God, is also Jehovah, Jehovah God. Okay, now let's look, go to Job and let's look at the last word for rebellion that we're going to look at. Job. 37, Job 34, 37. It says, For he addeth rebellion unto his sin. He clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against God. You know what that uh, rebellion there means? That's Strong 6588. And it means transgression or sin against God. So we can see here that rebellion is a sin. If I hadn't already convinced you up to this point that rebellion is a sin, there it is in the Word, right there. It's a sin to be in rebellion. Rebellion is an evil spirit. And rebellion is not a good thing. Rebellion is not a good thing. Now, let's think about... Well, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me get back to where I need to be. I'll cover that in a little bit. Okay. All right. Let's go to Jeremiah 28, verse 16. It says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because what? Thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. See, not only did the children of Israel rebel, the, the leaders rebel against the Lord, but they taught the people around them to rebel. They led them in rebellion. If you go back and study the kings and and things that, that rule over Israel. Some of them were horrible people. I mean, they did terrible things. Now, that word there is Strong's 5627, and it means apostasy, or defection, or turning aside. What did the children of Israel, what did the leaders of Israel do? They taught apostasy. What is apostasy? That's going away from God. And that's turning aside. So, we can see from these words that we, a rebellion, these different scriptures that we looked at, God does not look upon rebellion lightly. Rebellion is not a good thing, folks. It is not a good thing. It is something that we need to deal with. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Why did Saul lose his kingship? Because he rebelled against God. He rebelled against God. And the sad thing about Saul is, is when Samuel, the prophet, confronted him with his sin, he wouldn't repent. You know, if Saul had come before God and humbled himself and repented, we don't know what would have happened. He probably would have not lost his kingship. But what happened? He refused. What did he say to Samuel? You pray to your God and ask him. You pray to your God and repent for me. So, we see here that his cons uh, rebellion is considered a sin of witchcraft. Now, the original text reads like this. Rebellion is as sinful as, witch as witchcraft. That's what the original Hebrew text says. So, so he's saying in the original text, rebellion is just as bad, just as sinful as witchcraft. Now, that word witchcraft is strong 7081. That means divination. How did, how did God view divination? As an abomination to the Lord. Isn't that what he said? Spirit of divination. What is that? What's the spirit of divination? That's a counterfeit Holy Spirit. 
that gives information to someone and the people thinks it is the Holy Spirit speaking to them. We, we don't have time to go read it, but Acts 16.16, 16, you'll see a spirit of divination where the, the girl that was hired by the soothsayers, the girl that was hired by the uh, soothsayers to prophesy, and they made money off of her. She started prophesying about Paul. She kept following him around a day or two there prophesying about him. And what was interesting is this, what she was saying about the Apostle Paul was true, but the Apostle Paul didn't want her working for the devil, prophesying about him, so he turned around and cast the spirit of divination out. If you look that word uh, divination up, it says python, which is a snake, right? This is a little off the topic, but let me cover this with you. Yoga. Yoga practices with using spirit of python. Did you know that? You know yoga. What the yoga believes is, is that, that at the base of our spine, there is the spirit of python or yeah, the spirit of python and it's wrapped around our tailbone bottom of our spine and as we practice yoga which is by the way worshiping hindu gods i know i get in trouble for this but you know i don't care if you call it christian yoga or not christian yoga yoga is yoga when you're buying down you're going through those poses you're paying homage to a hindu god and God is not happy with that because that is idolatry. So what they believe is, is that as you practice yoga, that spirit of python begins to travel up the, your spine through the different chakras, chakras and until it gets to the top of here and looks out over you and it takes over your mind. And just let me say this about yoga, is that yoga can lead people into mental illness. Okay? Yoga is not a good thing. And the only reason I'm covering this is, is because I didn't have this in my notes. But God wanted me to share this for somebody. Somebody needs to hear this. Don't practice yoga. I don't care. You can, you can call it whatever you want to. You can call it Christian yoga. You can call it stretching. You can call it whatever. But if you are practicing yoga in those positions, you are paying homage to a Hindu god. And you are in a form of rebellion. So that's not good. Okay, let me get back to what I was talking about here. So, so let's talk about now where did rebellion begin? Go back to the book of beginnings, Genesis. Isn't it interesting how so many of these things originated in the book of Genesis, isn't it? <laughs> Through the fall of man. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to go to verse 16. Genesis 2, 16. It says, well let's start with verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. Now notice that was the instructions that he gave to Adam. This was before he made Eve. Okay? Why did he give it to Adam first? Because Adam was the head. Adam was created first. And God said that Adam was to be the head. That's the reason why the man is to be the head in the marriage. Because the marriage is patterned after the Godhead. Okay? So, we see here, and, and, and now let's go down and read, uh, uh, go to Genesis 3, chapter 6. Verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Okay? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took all the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made aprons for, and made themselves aprons. And the Lord and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool in the, of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called out unto Adam, and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Who told thee that thou was naked? 
So what happened here? Adam and Eve, had, Adam was given instructions. Look, don't you eat, you can have the fruit of every tree in this garden except this one over here. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't touch it. If you touch it, you're going to die. Now, he didn't mean they would die physically because when Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't die physically right then, did they? It wasn't like they tasted the fruit of the tree and God zapped them and they died. Now, we know death was entered into the planet through Adam and Eve. That's where it began. But it was years later before it actually manifested to take them out in death when they died. And so, they rebelled against God by disobeying one commandment. Think about that. One commandment they disobeyed. And really, you can say that Adam and Eve had a one-verse Bible. What did that verse say? Don't eat of the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The only verse they had to keep. That's the only one. So we can see where rebellion came in. So rebellion was introduced into this planet through Adam and Eve disobeying God's law. And we have seen rebellion all the way down from Adam. We've seen that all the way down from Adam. Then also we know that along with the rebellion, what joined them? Guilt and shame and fear. Those three things came in to this planet through the sin of Adam. Rebellion, guilt and shame, and fear. Fear. So they were tempted by the serpent to disobey God, which opened the door to rebellion. Now, we we'll see a common thread here of disobedience, don't we? Notice what opened the door to rebellion in every case was disobedience. Disobedience. So the Bible says when we disobey, that's not a good thing, right? What did he say in Deuteronomy? I said before you, life and death, choose life. If you hearken to my words, you will be blessed. If you don't, you'll have the curses. So we have a choice. So, let's talk about the door points of rebellion. What opens the doors to rebellion? Number one, it may be generational. It may be generational. Many of the spiritual roots that we look at when we are ministering to people, and we go to our spiritual root bank and look up a disease, so many of them have generational rebellion. Generational rebellion. Now, it may be rebellion in there. It may just say rebellion, but in many, many cases, it says generational rebellion. What does that tell us? Our fathers, that generation, that spirit of rebellion has been in our fathers and is passed down and we have participated with it also. Generational rebellion. See, and let me give you an example. The example is Adam and Eve. Adam rebelled, didn't he? What happened? Who was, our, who was Adam and Eve's first sons? Cain and Abel. What happened? We know the story, right? God told them to bring their sacrifice. And they had been taught the proper sacrifice. They knew what sacrifice they were supposed to bring. And the proper sacrifice was an animal. Because remember, when Adam and Eve sinned and the Lord came to the garden, what's the first thing he did? And they had sinned. Is he killed an animal and made them, took animal skins and made them clothing, right, to cover their nakedness. And so what happened is, is he set the pattern. And if you follow all the way through the Bible, what's always the sacrifice for sin? It's animal blood, isn't it? Look at the Old Testament. The sacrifices was always having to do with sin was an animal sacrifice. And then what happened when Jesus came? What was the sacrifice that Jesus gave? Was his blood his blood was a sacrifice for sin, right? His Bible says his blood took, took away the sins of mankind. It didn't just cover it like the animals did, the blood of animals under the, under the law, where they had to make that sacrifice every day, every, not every day, every year. And whenever they, made a, when they had a sin, when they committed a sin, they went to the priest and had to make a sacrifice. We don't have to do that. Jesus paid the sacrifice, sacrifice for all the sin by his blood being sprinkled on the mercy seat of God. When, after he was raised from the dead, he came out and he went to heaven and cut a covenant with God 
the Father and Jesus, and we are the beneficiary of that covenant using His blood that was collected from the cross that He shed. Now, don't ask me how He did it. I don't know, and I don't have a clue, and I don't try to figure it out. All I know is what the Word says, and all I know is, is I know what that covenant did, that blood covenant that Jesus and my Father God entered into, and I'm the beneficiary of it, and I am so happy, and I am so thankful because I don't have to bring those animals in all the time or every year and, and sacrifice them for sin. So the blood was always the sacrifice for sin. In the case of Cain and Abel, what did Cain, what kind of sacrifice did Cain bring? He brought a grain sacrifice. What was that sacrifice from, that offering from? From the ground. The ground was cursed when Adam and Eve sinned. So what did God say to Cain? Cain, you brought the wrong sacrifice. Go back and get the right one. What did Cain do? Cain got into rejection and said, God is rejecting me. God didn't reject Cain. He rejected his sacrifice. All Cain had to do was go get him some two or three bushel of wheat and go to Abel and say, Come on, brother, let me trade you some wheat for one of these animals over here and bring the right sacrifice back. So in essence... Cain rebelled against God. So you see that generational rebellion in Adam and Eve was transferred down to Cain. And you know what? If you go study the line of Cain, rebellion was rampant in his line. All the way through his line was rebellion. They were a very rebellious people because of Cain's rebellion. And Adam's rebellion was passed down to Cain. And Cain, by the way, had many, many offsprings. Many, his if you looked at his family tree, there are many, many people in that make up his family tree. And rebellion was rampant in that. Cain rebelled. And if you, if you study Cain, Cain didn't have a lot of peace in his life. Why? Because of his rebellion to, from, to God and his laws. So, can be passed generationally. Not always, but it can be. So when we look at that rebellion, we look to see if it's in the generations. Okay, the next door point that can open us up to general, uh, rebellion is in the workplace. And you say, how in the world can the workplace open me up to rebellion? Let me let you in on a little secret. There's a lot of rebellion that goes on as a result of workplace situations. See, the person in charge tells us you to do something, wants something done this way, but we decide we want to do it our way. We, don't want, we think we can do it better. So rather than obeying what our boss tells us to do, we want to do it our way, or we do it our way, and we rebel. And see, sometimes we need to recognize that when we are under authority or have a boss or something, sometimes we got to submit to their will rather than our will. We have to remember that we can't always have our will. It's not, we don't have to always, we need to, let me say it this way, we have to recognize that we don't always have to have our will. We don't have to have our will. See, it's, it's, I say it this way, it's more important to do the right thing than it is to be right. And let me give you an example in the worst place. Let's say, for example, your boss comes to you and he says, I want you to do this, 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 and this. Well, you know that that's not the proper way to do it. Now, you might say to him, well, boss, I don't know. I think that this would be a better way. And he says, no, no, no. I want you to do it this way. What you need to do to do the right thing is, is do it his way. It may blow up in his face down the road, and he'll come back and you'll do it your way, but you need to obey what he said. Don't defile, defy what he said and go ahead and do it your way. That is a form of rebellion. See, if whenever he wants us to change, and if, if it grates against us, in other words, we rear up and, and even though we do it, we don't do it with a proper attitude. That is a form of rebellion. And see, sometimes what people do is, is, is while they're doing it his way, they're complaining to all their people around them and contributing to division. Now, I know I'm hitting home now to some people because we see a lot of division in the workplace, and rebellion can be a cause of that. See, if we won't let go of what we think we know best, that's a Luciferian spirit of rebellion. And it shouldn't be that way. So that can open the door to rebellion. 
Next one, door point, can be resistant change. That's along the same lines, but sometimes things change and we want it the old way. How many times did the children of Israel say, I wish to God we'd have stayed in Egypt. What were they doing? They were rebelling against what they should be doing. When Moses and God said to Moses, I want you to, do, want you to take the children to do this, they said, no, we don't want to do that. Wish to God we'd have stayed in Egypt. Every, people always want to go back to Egypt. But think about what was in Egypt. Egypt is not something that we want to go back to. The children of Israel did not have it easy in Egypt. I don't know why they'd even bring that up if they want to go back to Egypt. So we need to recognize that we are under authority, and they said it's going to change, so to oppose it or grumble about it is rebellion. And I'll tell you, a lot of times if we don't get into rebellion, the person that wanted to do it a certain way, God may move on, his, on their heart, and they'll come back to you and say, you know, I've been thinking about this, and I thought about what you shared about the way that you think this should be done. I kind of agree with you. Let's try it your way. See how God worked in that situation? And see, you're the hero because you did the right thing. The next one is ungodly order in the home. We know that ungodly order in the home causes rebellion in the children. And that's one of the reasons why that we have so many rebellious children today is because of ungodly order in the home. The father's not properly representing being the head of the family and this sort of thing and the, the mother having to or the wife having to step up and take control of the family which is not God's uh, idea and that's not the best, highest and best. That's spirit of passivity in the husbands. So that's why the children rebel. I tell people if you, if a father loves their children properly the children won't rebel. Now when they get to be 13 or 14 years old, there may be some little bit of issues regarding the children because it seems if they get about 13 or 14, they begin to sprout their wings. They get a little bit, they can get a little bit, cause a few problems back then and everything. But if they have been taught and loved properly, that will not be a major problem. Shouldn't be a major problem there. So children can get it lead into rebellion. And really, when the father is not being the head of his family, he's rebelling against the order of God that God ordered for the marriage. So, so you can see how the child rebels because the spirit of rebellion in the father's passed down because what's in the father's passed down to the children. Okay, the next one that can open the door to rebellion is abuse. Abuse. See, we go into rebellion when someone in a position of power or authority over us abuses that power. See, Rebellion comes in and promises to keep us safe as, we believe, as long as we believe that it has a legal right to, say, to stay. So what does it say? Let me say that again. Rebellion promises to keep us safe and as long as we believe that it has a legal right to stay. That spirit of rebellion will bring thoughts to us and say, Look, I will protect you and keep you safe if you will listen to me. You keep rebelling and you'll stay safe. See, Rebellion is one of the devil's anesthetics that he uses for abuse. You know what an anesthetic is, right? That's something to give you to, that they give you to numb the pain, right? If you go and you're going to have a root canal, what does the doctor do? He numbs it before he starts drilling, right? Hopefully. That's what he's supposed to do, right? Or if you're going to have surgery, they give you something to numb the pain. Well, that's what the enemy uses for rebellion to numb the pain of abuse. Because I can tell you, because I've met to too many people that has, has been abused. There is pain that comes out of abuse. Okay, the next one is rejection. That's number six. Rejection opens the door to rebellion. If we call in, get into rejection, that can open the door to re rebellion. Because when a person is rejection, uh, rejected, it opens the door to rebellion and it comes in and what does it say? What does a person say? I'm going to show you that I can make it. That's rebellion. Also, there's some other spirits that can open the door to rebellion. One of them is accusation. A spirit of accusation will open the door to rebellion. 
The unloving spirit will open, open the door to rebellion. Selfishness, person that's selfish can get in, end up in rebellion. Addictions, addictions, is that's a form of rebellion. We're rebelling about what God says. He says that He's what we need to fill that void of being that little part of us that He created in us to be loved. But what are we doing? We're rebelling against Him and going and looking everywhere else for it. And I came across a definition regarding a rebellion as how it um, applies in addictions. And let me read it to you here. I found it. I thought it was really good because it has to do with addictions. Um, here's the definition. It is an altered state of consciousness. What does addictions do? It alters our state of conscience, doesn't it? To protect us from fearful environments enforced by excessive release of dopamine. What do we know about um, addictions? Addictions, a lot of the addictions has to do with a dopamine release. So first of all, the enemy brings an addiction to us to take us to an altered state of consciousness. In other words, to soothe the pain. And then, an altered state of conscience to protect us from fearful environments enforced by excessive release of dopamine. So that's a definition I came across that fits into how rebellion and uh, spirit of addiction work together. So now let's go look at some other door points. Uh, occultism, spirit of occultism brings rebellion. People get into the occult. Some of the most rebellious people I've, I've known have been involved in the occult. And I'm telling you, that rebellion in the occult is they want to wear it on their sleeve and they want everybody to know that they're in rebellion. I mean, you, some of those people that's been in the occult are, are really, can be very, very nasty. can be very nasty. So in, a, in addition to addictions and causing, uh, which is a door point for uh, rebellion, there's generational rebellion, which I've already talked about. It's generational rebellion. Rebellion in a generation is passed down. So what does rebellion do? It will cause you to blame someone else so that all the other yucky puckies will not have to go or they have a legal right to stay there. That's what rebellion does. Gets you to blame someone else. Remember what the enemy does? What does the enemy do? He calls it, he orchestrates the problem, then he gets you to blame God, yourself, or someone else. And rebellion helps you to do that, to blame anyone other than Satan and his kingdom. An example of that is self-pity, bitterness, accusation, etc. Now, let's look at a couple of thoughts that the spirit of rebellion will bring to you. This way, we need to, if we hear the, think about these thoughts here, this will help us to be able to recognize if we have rebellion. You ever said, nobody's going to tell me what to do? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I know what I'm going to do. I don't care what they said. I'm going to do it my way. You ever heard that? I know none of you ever said that, but, you know, you probably have heard somebody else say that, or you will in the future, so you know there's a spirit of rebellion. Nobody's going to tell me what I can eat and not eat. I've heard that one many times. Nobody's going to tell me what I can eat and not eat. And this thought will come to you. You will feel safe if you rebel. Rebel and you'll feel safe. See, that's what the spirit of rebellion does. Comes in and tells you, look, if you'll rebel and let me help you, I'll make you feel safe because I'll make sure that no one else will reject you. I'll make sure no one else will, uh, will hurt you. Okay, let's talk about a few diseases that have rebellion as a root. And this is not a complete list. This is just some I just picked out as I was going through looking to, for some examples. Spinal stenosis, that's where there's a narrowing of the spine. That is a popular disease today. There's a narrowing of the spine, and the narrowing of the spine closes off the nerves, and that can affect, if it's in the lower spine, the nerves that feed out from the base of your spine into your legs. So by the narrowing of the spinal columns, that pinches the nerve, and it keeps the nerves not getting sufficient nerve supply to the legs. That can cause weakness in the legs. Spinal stenosis. Here's one, breech birth. You know what's rebellion causes in a breech birth? Won't let rebellion won't let the baby turn. The baby won't turn over because see the baby's supposed to rotate before it comes down the birth canal. 
In a breech birth, the baby does not rotate. People who have breech births, they go back and look, and in many cases, they find that there's a, there is rebellion in the generations. So if there's rebellion in the father, for example, or in the father's lines, it may affect the baby. And talking about breech births, I saw research where that they looked at, this is over in England, they did a study. They looked at 1,200 cases of people that had, was born breech. In every case, the second generation had a birth, had a breech birth. Skip the first generation, but the second generation popped up. What does that tell us? The enemy does not, he'll skip generations with his curses. Another one is uh, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia has a rebellion as part of it. Spinal bifida, that can be rebellion. That's where the spinal uh, column does not sufficiently heal, it's left open. Dillwagger's hump, that's the hump, shoulder with the big hump on the shoulder. Rebellion, rebellion. Asperger's, that's, a, that's similar to OCB and those type of issues. Fistula, and I chose this one because most people have never heard of this. And you can learn something today that you probably did not know. What is a fistula? That's a leaking in the small intestines. And why, what causes that? Sometimes people that have surgery, they nick the intestines. That's a fistula. However, if a person has rebellion, the intestines may begin to leak because of the attack of spirit of infirmity from the devil. The intestines just begin to leak. That's the small intestines. Um... This is polydactyly, and you probably never heard that one either. That's where a person is, for, is born with multiple fingers and toes. Okay? This is more prominent than most people realize. Because you know what they do now? Is if a baby is born with an extra finger, when he's two or three days old, they go in and snip it off. And they don't have that. Now, in my day, when I was growing up, they didn't do that. As a matter of fact, one of my daddy's friends had six fingers on both hands. He had a little finger coming out here. Okay? That can be caused by rebellion. Nephtalotosis. What is that? Nephto tells us what? It's a kidney, right? It's a kidney sliding out of place. Now you say a kidney sliding out of place? Yes. Sometimes kidneys slide out of place. If you know anything about the body, there's not a whole lot of room down there in our cavity in our body. So that kidney slides out of place and it's pressing upon the bladder and it causes severe pain. Sometimes this happens in car accidents. The, the, the jolt from the car accident is so severe that it causes the kidneys to slide. And that, they get out of place and that can be rebellion there. Type 2 diabetes, can, there can be rebellion there. And here's one that I'm sure we all can probably relate to, homosexuality. Homosexuality is a form of rebellion. And that form of rebellion is the reason why that some of those people act the way that they act. And they're so bold and they're in your face with it, and this sort of thing. Now, not all of them. Some of them are very meek and calm, but some of them are very bold and they want to they want to show it off, so to speak. That's a form of rebellion. Rebellion. That's the spirit of rebellion. And we also see that in lesbianism. The females are very outspoken and loud and want to be dominant and they have a guttural swearing and this sort of thing. That's a form of rebellion. And the enemy is manifesting that rebellion to them before us. And see, what really is happening is is we really should feel very, very sorry for those people because they're in torment. They're in torment. Okay, uh, obsessive defiant behavior, OCB. That is a form of rebellion. Also, narcissistic personality disorder. A person who is a narcissist may have, a general, may have a rebellion. So these are just some of the diseases that come out of the generation of, of the rebellion, spirit of rebellion. And notice the spirit of rebellion works with the other evil spirits, as I've said. So, let's deal with the spirit of rebellion, since now that I've finished my teaching, I'm sure that 
you have recognized there are some out there that may need to deal with it. So let's deal with it generation. Repeat this after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I recognize that I have participated with generational rebellion. I did not know that was a sin, but I see I have participated with it through the generational curse. So, Father God, your word says that Jesus bore the curse. So, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I appropriate what Jesus did for me on the cross by declaring that the generational curse of rebellion is broken. I no longer will participate with it. That curse has no place on me, in me, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God. For sharing this truth with me. So that I can be free. From the spirit of rebellion. Amen. Now Father God I come before you. And I thank you Father God. For freeing your people. You see your people today. That is here. And they need freedom. From the spirit of rebellion. And I ask that you would reach down. And touch them. And break that law. of uh, Break that curse. Of the law of generational Rebellion, in Jesus' name. Amen.